that's what I'm seeing. Like all these negative tests and they're and they're putting them on these fans. It hopeful that they'll get it. They're being put on these COVID floor is murder. Erin Marie Olszewski, a military nurse working at the epicenter of the epicenter of the epicenter, which is supposed to be New York Elmhurst Hospital, Queens, where we are told the most people are dying of COVID, 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 COVID. She's a hero, okay? She went undercover in the hospital with video camera, with audio, talking to nurses, talking to doctors, and she was interviewed at length over an hour and 10 minutes. There she is on your screen. This is a major, gigantic smoking gun on what is happening. I'm pulling up like their laboratory results. So if you look here, you'll see COVID-19 bioreference lab. Here are the test results. As you can see, 5-1-2020 at uh, 17-16, not detected. They test for a second time, 5-4-2020 um, at 17-59, not detected. So both of those are negative. Scroll up to the top. This is my patient. They are on a vent and they are being called COVID-19 confirmed. Droplet in contact and eye protection. Erin Marie Olszewski. Video camera in the hospital, undercover, for an extended period of time, not just once. Audio in the hospital. As she said, put on ventilators. Put on ventil. This is very serious treatment. What's happening at this hospital? Reality. I compare this hospital to a third world country. I've been in a third world country hospital in Iraq. The Iraq hospital is better than this one, and that says a lot. I've been there. I, I've had. I've been in both hospitals. There are good nurses that work there too. Like I have made good friends with a lot of the nurses that do work there. There's good people, but they're outnumbered. What, so what happens? People come in like this 37 year old and what was he complaining of or what, what was going Respiratory on? Respiratory distress. He didn't have COVID either. He, he did not have COVID. And how do we know that? I, ha I took care of him. I have the same type of um, results from his chart as I do with my other patient. It was like the day before intubation, he was fine on the yeah. rebreather. And then they intubated and then he got a new mold and then they put in a cap tube and then it's a shift. And now he's 37 years old and dead. Yeah. I'm, that's what I'm seeing, like all these negative tests <laughs> and, they're, and they're putting them on these fans. It, hopeful that they'll get it. They're being put on these COVID floor is murder. It, it straight up is, it is setting these people up for failure based on. Okay, it's murder. It's murder. What does she decide to do? Erin Marie Olszewski. She decides to expose everything that's going on and laying it out to the public and to any public officials that want to know what exactly is happening? Because they're all scared. Everybody's scared. And everybody's scared to stick up for themselves. And I've called a lot of doctors unethical to their face. And they deserve it. Calling doctors unethical to their face and they deserve it. She deserves every amount of support we can give her because she's put herself at great risk in many ways. And we're, this is in the United States. And this hospital is treating low income mostly um, people and it almost makes me feel like they think these people are disposable and they're not they're 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 people you know everybody people are not disposable you know especially especially these the ones that are struggling day in and day out the hard workers you know like trying to reach that American dream and they're not given a chance because they're brought to this place where nobody cares. And is there uh, a, an understood financial incentive to diagnose COVID? Yeah, of course. So in the hospital that I'm in right now, it's all COVID at this point. It's all COVID. Financial incentive 
to diagnose people with COVID. Their own tests are negative. They're diagnosed with COVID. And again, what does that mean? It isn't just a game they're playing to get money. It is that because the insurance payouts, as I've described before, are considerably higher when you have a patient come into the hospital and is diagnosed as COVID. We understand that. We're talking about something a lot more serious than that for the patient, which is they're put on a train from the point of the diagnosis in this hospital onto ventilators. Highly risky procedure. It's not just, I'll put them on a vent. No. The people that are working these things have to know exactly what they're doing, have to be doing it for exactly the right reason with the individual patient, if absolutely necessary. This is not a one size fits all. It's much worse than just the ventilator. There's more involved on this train to death and nowhere than just being put on a ventilator, which itself is dangerous enough. Using the wrong protocol, too much pressure on the lungs, collapsing the lungs, destroying the patient's life, etc. Pneumonia that leads to death. I guess the word traveled after this. You mentioned earlier that this, that this is a common occurrence where people come in able to speak and they just have what, low oxygen levels and then and they're put on a vent. Is, is so? What, what's what, what's going on there? Um. I don't know. I honestly, I, I have no idea how they're assuming everybody is just the same. It, there's no individuality anymore. These residents, I think a lot of them are just stone cold. You know, there's no emotion and they don't view people as people anymore. And it's really sad. Like we came, I came a little bit later, you know, after the big rush, but there was still a lot of people coming in. And a lot of us are, were just in shock. Within the first couple days, you could see exactly what was going on. My bigger problem with this whole scenario is when they intubate people who don't need it. Yeah. And it looks very clear to me that they're just pushing it. You almost feel like you are literally living in the twilight zone. Living in the twilight zone, intubating people that don't need it, meaning putting them on ventilators when they absolutely don't need it. It's murder. A trusted emergency room doctor, not at this hospital, another hospital, said, one of the things that these doctors now don't realize is that many elderly people live with chronically low levels of oxygen. Is it optimal? No. Do they survive? Yes. It's just what is happening to them as they get older, as they get diagnosed, of course, with multiple uh, conditions and are treated with toxic drugs, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, they survive. But they come to a hospital like this, which, as uh, Aaron says, the residents there, they're not working like true professionals that are really competent and understand from experience what's going on. What killed him? Was being, did the vent kill him? Yeah. Oh, yes. They're so sedated. He had probably eight or nine drips. It's all sedation. It's all sedation and uh, paralytics. So you are asleep. It, it is essentially like you're you're under, you know, you're in surgery, you know, and they put you under like that um, for a good month straight. There's no way you can recover from something like that. You're be brain dead if you do. What she's talking about there is not just the fake COVID diagnosis leading on the train to the ventilator. And she's not just talking about the patient being given a light muscle relaxer while on the ventilator. What killed him? Was being, did the vent kill him? Yeah, oh yes. They're so sedated. He had probably eight or nine drips. It's all sedation. It's all sedation and uh, paralytics. So you are asleep. It is essentially like you're, you're under, you know, you're in surgery you know, when they put you under like that um, for a good month straight. There's no way you can recover from something like that. You're be brain dead if you do. Massive sedation. The person never wakes up under a ventilator, sedated, isolated, 
no friends, no family permitted, dies. The endless amounts of economic destruction, the health destruction. They won't use like other treatments that are being that are successful around the world. And I had a conversation with a doctor about this. And- are you guys doing like different sorts of like treatments? Because I know like nothing works. They have. Yeah, but I mean, there's, you know, they're coming out with different things I that know. are in the testing it's phase. It's the same thing they came with a track on them that kill more people than actually save. Uh-huh. So that's one. And he said that they don't work anyway. And I told him, well, obviously what you guys have going on here isn't working. So what's the harm in trying? I don't expect any of these people to survive. Uh-huh. 90% of them would die. I mean, it's just maintaining. So I figured if it's assumed they're going to die anyway, yeah. just try why not throw a few. Well, it's, you know, yeah. I, I don't know. That's that's always an issue in medicine, whether you should just throw things, whether they're dying anyway or not. I. But if you could if, find a cure. Well, yeah, I mean, there's like no if, cure. So there's no antiviral therapy. The only way to do it is a cure. But I, there's or no treatment, antiviral. I should say. Re- yeah. Rephrase, you treatment. Could, you could <laughs> treat it, but, but, you know, it's, you have to have some scientific basis for whether these things are working or not, and just throwing everything at them. You could make them worse. Uh-huh. So, yeah. Worse you know, than death? Huh? Worse than death? Well, we you said 90%, maybe that 10%, maybe, <laughs> maybe <laughs> they're true, I don't know. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, so, hmm. but, I mean, if there's no basis for it working, I mean, you wouldn't just try things just because, I mean. I would. Oh, I might, if it could yeah. save my life. <laughs> yeah. Erin Marie Olszewski, military nurse in the military, in civilian life goes to the epicenter of the epicenter, and eventually, because she's horrified at what she's seeing, decides to do something that very few people would do while still working there. A camera in her glasses, undercover, day after day, audio, video, gathering information, and then having that interview and just laying it out there completely as to what's happening. The whole story. Not many people would do that. Millions of Americans remain subjected to unprecedented restrictions on their personal lives, their daily lives, their families' lives. The coronavirus lockdowns continue in many places. You may not know that because it gets no publicity, but it's true. And if you're living under it, you definitely know. As a result of this, tens of millions of people are now unemployed. A huge number of them have no prospects of working again. Many thousands of small businesses are closed and will never reopen. More Americans have become dependent on drugs and alcohol, seen their marriages dissolve, become clinically depressed. Some of them delayed their weddings. Others were banned by the government from burying their loved ones in funerals. Some Americans will die of cancer because they couldn't get cancer screenings. Some unknown number have taken their own lives in despair. Others have flooded the streets to riot because bottled up rage and frustration take many forms. The cost of shutting down the United States and denying our citizens desperately needed contact with one another is hard to calculate, but the cost has been staggering. The people responsible for doing all of this say they have no regrets about it. We faced a global calamity, they say. COVID-19 was the worst pandemic since the Spanish flu. That flu killed 50 million people. We had no choice. We did the right thing. That's what they're telling us. Is it true? The answer to that question matters, not just because the truth always matters, but because the credibility of our leaders is at stake here. This is the biggest decision they have made in our lifetimes. They were able to make it. They rule because we let them. Their power comes from us. So the question now and always is, are they worthy of that power? That's not a conversation they want to have. And right now they don't have to have that conversation because right now All of us are distracted and mesmerized by the woke revolution underway outside. But we do think it's worth, for a minute, taking a pause to assess whether or not they were, in fact, lying to us about the coronavirus and our response to it. And the short answer is this. Yes, they were definitely lying. As a matter of public health, we can say conclusively the lockdowns were not necessary. In fact, we can prove that. And here's the most powerful evidence. States that never locked down at all states where people were allowed to live like Americans and not cower indoors alone, in the end turned out no worse than states that had mandatory quarantines, the state you probably live in. The states that did lock down at first but were quick to reopen have not seen explosions of coronavirus cases. 
All of this is the opposite of what they said would happen, with great confidence. The media predicted mass death at places like Lake of the Ozarks and Ocean City, Maryland, places where the middle class dares to vacation. But those deaths never happened. In the end, the Wuhan coronavirus turned out to be a dangerous disease, but a manageable disease like so many others. Far more dangerous were the lockdowns themselves.